basically, my topic is going to be management of patients with dementia. And uh, um, I would like to start with a quote from Kare Mulligan, who is actually an English actress who uh, has described her experience with her grandmother, who was a patient with dementia. So this is what she says. Those with dementia are still people, and they still have stories, and they still have character, and they're all individuals, and they're all unique. They just need to be interacted with on a human level. I think this forms a, a essence of what I'm going to speak to you all about, because uh, when it comes to principles of management, it includes pharmacological and non-pharmacological. But if we actually uh, actually look into it, it's uh, basically the uh, non-pharmacological approach, which is uh, very important, because many patients do not um, uh, show much improvement with pharmacological approaches. So I'll start off with the pharmacological management, as uh, I know that my colleague has uh, already spoken about dementia and the types of dementia in a previous webinar. So the main, the commonest form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, and one of the main groups of drugs that are used are the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. And we know that the main drugs are donopacil and rivastigmine and galantamine. And uh, we know that uh, donopacil actually is a long-acting reversible acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, and the maintenance dose is around five to ten milligrams per day. And also, we have the sustained release uh, preparation. And uh, rivastigmine is a pseudo irreversible cholinesterase inhibitor, which is selective for acetylcholinesterase and butylcholinesterase. And uh, we can go up to uh, doses of six milligrams twice daily. And also we have a transdermal patch. And galantamine is a reversible competitive acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, which is uh, prescribed uh, either as eight or 12 milligrams twice daily. So, as any drug, we have. Um, uh, side effects and the most common side effects are uh, for donopacil are nausea, diarrhea, insomnia, vomiting, muscle cramps, fatigue, anorexia, dizziness, abdominal pain, myasthenia, rhinitis, weight loss, and anxiety and syncope. And same with rivastigmine, a lot of gastrointestinal disturbances along with fatigue, asthenia, headache, sweating, weight loss, uh, weight loss uh, somnolence, and syncope. Uh, galantamine also has gastrointestinal disturbances. In addition, they have dizziness, tremor, and syncope. Uh, when we consider the long-term safety of cholinesterase inhibitors, they have not been systematically studied, but um, one of the uh, articles that, uh, 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 that was done in 2010 and that appeared in clinical therapeutics say that um, syncope is twice more in those who are not, uh, on medication rather than those who are not on medication. And 69% increase in bradycardia has been reported and as well as a 49% increase in having a pacemaker implanted has uh, been reported. And also an 18% increase in falls and risk of hip fractures. The next drug that is commonly used is memantine, which has moderate affinity and is an uncompetitive methyl D aspartate, that is NMDA receptor antagonist, and it has been uh, approved by the FDA for moderate to severe disease. Um, adverse effects are headache, dizziness, confusion, somnolence, hallucinations, and um, gastrointestinal symptoms. And uh, the dosage is about five milligrams per day and it's increased weekly by five milligrams a day up to a maintenance dose of 10 milligrams twice daily. It can be prescribed alone or added on to a choline esterase inhibitor. Um, slightly preferred because of the better um, side effect profile. So the, another main question that we have to think is how long do we treat a patient? Because there are some patients who will not respond to therapy. So, um, it's very difficult to identify the patients who would benefit from therapy. So we have to, when we start treating the patient, we, we set a goal and it would say like, uh, if you don't improve within six months or 12 months, we would either taper the uh, dose and discontinue it. Um, but if they show improvement, then we would continue uh, using one of the uh, drugs mentioned above. And if you ask for evidence, yes, the trial evidence is inadequate, or equivocal. So I would like to uh, stress more on the uh, non-pharmacological approaches. And the first and foremost uh, thing would be to minimize the distress and discomfort. 
If you have ever come across patients with dementia, we all know that their main problem is they have severe distress and um, discomfort, and these are mainly due to memory loss. So often we have these patients who are unable to recognize their close relatives, and even some of them are so bad that they cannot recognize their own self-reflection on the mirror. So, and they lose their way in familiar surroundings. And they all, I'm sorry, it's raining heavily over here. Sorry for the disturbance. They lose their way in familiar surroundings and they also feel that the, they're living in the past and they may talk about the past, may talk about their schooling, their work. So this can cause a lot of distress to the patient. So, and the second problem is they lose the ability to communicate and, um, they gradually lose their ability to speak, they repeat words, or they, in later stages, they may even cry out and they cannot perceive emotional signals. Uh, I'll be going into details about communication in my next point, and we must always be aware of this and uh, preserve their dignity. Uh, so if you know a patient has dementia, it's better not uh, you know, ask him to identify someone or it will be much better nicer if we can introduce the patient to him so that the patient's dignity is always uh, preserved. The next problem that they commonly face is loss of mobility and they first become chair bound and then they can become bed bound. At this stage it's very important to involve a multidisciplinary team where we involve the physiotherapist and the occupational therapist who would help the patient with assistive devices and adaptations uh, which would improve their mobility. The patients also have difficulty in swallowing and this leads to weight loss. So we need to um, get the help from one of the speech and language pathologists to assess their uh, swallowing ability. And based on the outcome, we may have to help them with um, either using a, a nasogastric tube or a PEG tube. And also we need to get the assistance from the nutritionist to see that they get a balanced diet. Uh, they also have problems with continence and uh, the first thing that if a patient has a problem with continence, we have to make sure that these symptoms are not due to any other coexisting medical causes such as a urinary tract infection or the patient having um, uh, a severe constipation or whether it's a side effect of the medications that they are using or um, whether they have any prostate problems or other things which can lead to uh, medical things that can lead to uh, problems with continence. And uh, also, we have to realize that because of their memory loss, they may not remember and they may not feel the urge to um, use the toilet at the correct time. Uh, if all problems have been sorted out, and there is, then we should try to help the patient with um, methods of uh, maintaining their dignity and um, helping them solve this problem. Uh, coming to unusual behaviors, this is quite common in patients uh, at the later stages of dementia where they are more agitated and confused and uh, this can make it very hard for the, uh, uh, for the carers and these symptoms are more um, common in the late afternoon and early evenings and is sometimes called the sundowning and uh, the patients uh, should be given additional help and attention during these times. Uh, in later stages, patients also have uh, delusions and hallucinations and they, may, they, they feel uh, threatened and this can also make them feel um, aggressive. So also when they, dis uh, they have a lot of distress, it's, uh, we should see whether there are any other causes such as um, any um, pain or they, whether they have uh, dehydration or any foot ulcers or any other things which is causing them uh, these uh, kind of unusual behaviors. Um, and also it's good to encourage them to take part in physical um, activities. So um, what can we do to minimize their uh, distress? So there are a few things that we need to check out, which we sometimes usually miss out, is if a patient is wearing spectacles, we have to make sure that he's having the appropriate uh, IVA, and also some of them may have hearing problems which may make their um, agitation and behavior worse. So we should always see that they have properly functioning um, 
hearing aids. And um, we should see that their medications are optimized. This would include medications for depression, for dementia, as well as other comorbidities, and um, make sure that they are compliant with their medications. And also, we should try to reduce environmental disturbances, which uh, sometimes leads uh, to the patient to get aggressive, such as too many people, too much of noise, too much activity, bright light, and also. Um, ensure that they do not have any uh, pain or any uh, discomfort. Um, so it's a bit of a hard work on the carer to, uh, to ensure that uh, the patient is kept comfortable and um, maintain an optimal balance. Uh, okay, the next topic that I would like to touch upon is treatment of dementia in later stages of life. Um, so when we um, take our community and our society, uh, generally if a patient comes uh, for any illness at a very late stage, it's uh, very common for the relative to say, don't, don't talk to my patient about, or to my relative about this, or don't tell them. And um, even sometimes they do not come forward to have a, 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 a fruitful discussion on what we are supposed to do at the very late stages of dementia. So uh, we need to think a lot about this because the question we, we have to answer here is, are we going to prolong the life of this patient uh, who's not having a good quality of life or whether we are going to help the pa uh, allow the patient to die with dignity? So the principles of end of life care play a very important role here. So it's very essential that we take the initiative to speak to the family and the relatives. Uh, we should be very clear in articulating this, but not offend the, them and offend their thoughts, but we have to help them to come to terms with it and make a reasonable uh, decision, uh, especially on um, what will happen. And in, 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 in our situation, it's most common that it's the medical team that takes on the uh, final decision, which would be based on the uh, best care that we are hoping to give the patient. So the discussions on end of life care should include resuscitation and um, um, antibiotic treatments in case of um, uh, uh, infections and uh, the extent to which we are going to treat the infections and also uh, whether we are going to pay the patient on a ventilator and um, such issues. Uh, so to do this, we also need to know what are the likely causes of, uh, of the patient's eventual death. So uh, uh, it's very tricky because uh, life expectancy is uh, unpredictable and the disease can uh, progress up to 10 years. So uh, of course, it does shorten the lifespan, but um, these are usually due to other medical conditions that occur as a result of the comorbidities of dementia, such as um, infections, uh, the most common being lung infection due to aspiration and uh, pressure sores, and uh, the other thing is uh, pulmonary embolisms and DVTs, and also uh, 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 any, any other infections that would expedite uh, the uh, death. But um, a few people uh, have also died due to natural causes. So um, as I told earlier, there are some uh, a few useful tips that we could use when communicating with a patient uh, with dementia. So uh, the patient may find uh, difficulties in pronouncing words. They may find difficulty in following conversations, difficulty in understanding humor and sarcasm. They may keep repeating things. The, they may be tired, they may be stressed out, and they always uh, um, speak on old memories. So what are the things that uh, we could uh, do to help these patients? So one of the most common scenarios is these patients always keep asking for their parents. Uh, so uh, as we all know that uh, uh, parents are always a source of comfort, security and love to anyone at any age. So what we should do is try to comfort the patient and offer them reassurance. Uh, they may talk about work uh, because that's what they may remember. And uh, so the main thing is we need to preserve their independence and encourage them to do uh, certain things. 
uh, if they're emotionally um, uh, 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 labile, then we should try to make them uh, comfortable by uh, trying to uh, uh, ease their uh, stresses and uh, threats. And also, uh, we need to reassure them and be quite gentle with them. And uh, most of these patients are faced with the inability to express themselves. Uh, so we should, have, we should try to understand what they need from their body language and cues. Uh, so to summarize some of the useful communication skills would be to stop uh, what you're doing and focus on the patient and pay full attention to them when they're trying to communicate with you, uh, limit the distractions and also address them by their name so that they, uh, they identify themselves in person. And we have to be very specific when we name a person or an object. We should show empathy and we should be uh, slow and clear and speak in very short sentences. And we should listen to them carefully. And it's also important that uh, without being impatient, we need to give the person enough time to answer. It's exceptionally good if we can maintain eye contact with the patient and if, the, if it's uh, gone to a state where the patient is unable to communicate at all, then we must develop techniques like using appropriate um, gestures, pictures, and also avoid too many questions. The next important thing is we always forget about the carers because we, uh, we always tend to think about the patient most of the time. But we have to realize that the carer is also having a lot of issues. So the most neglected group are the carers, and it's a very important part uh, in the management to address carer issues. So wh what are the issues that a carer can have? So you must understand that when we look after a dementia patient, right, it, there is an um, uh, immense pressure on the carer and nowadays there's terminology that's used and that's called the carer stress. The carer stress is defined as an unequal exchange of assistance among people who stand in close relationship to one another resulting in emotional and physical stress to the caregiver. Uh, so in simple terms, it is very essential that we understand the emotional and physical stress on the carer. So the carer can have positive feelings as well as negative feelings. So some of the positive feelings are that they are happy and they have a sense of accomplishment of looking after their family member and supporting the family. And also it, is, uh, it can cause a satisfaction for those who like to help others. But also there are, any carer will have negative uh, feelings as well because they are for have the stress, they have anxiety, they may have sleep depression, uh, deprivation, they may themselves go into depression because they cannot participate in recreational activities and uh, things that they like to do. They may be socially isolated where they can't um, go out for social events. They may face financial hardships because they cannot go to work. And also they may find it very difficult to um, physically manage these patients. So we should always spend a few minutes talking to the carers and supporting them. Uh, and uh, this is quite uh, difficult in our setup because when you go to the Western world, they have care homes and respites where uh, the carer can leave the patient for a few days and take some time off, but we don't have that facilities at the moment. So at least paying some attention to the carer can always uh, help the carer. So the next point is uh, driving. Because um, once a patient is uh, deprived from driving, they feel that they have lost their independence, right? So uh, by law, a diagnosis of dementia by itself does not um, warrant a patient to stop driving. But we have to always advise the patient and we also need to make a judgment on the patient's safety and the safety of the public. So, uh, and we also know that driving requires a lot of mental abilities. So it's good if the patient voluntarily stops driving when they feel that it is stressful or they lose confidence. 
And there are some points that we should remember that if during the history that we find out that the patient feels less confident and more irritable on the road, gets lost even in familiar routes, misjudges speed and distance, strays across uh, the lanes and hits curbs or meets with accidents, gets confused and has near misses or in terms of accidents, or the other patients who travel, the uh, other passengers who travel with the patients express uh, concern, we need to um, advise the patient in a very um, nice way that they should um, um, uh, stop driving. And uh, another main uh, problem that we have here is planning life when dementia is mild. Dementia is a progressive disease. So we all know that uh, uh, the patient will progress from a mild state to a severe state, but we don't know the time frame. So when the patient has still not lost um, uh, much of his cognitive and executive functioning, it might be a good thing to start uh, uh, talking to him about uh, planning his life. But again, as I told you in the end of life decision, in other cultural context, uh, uh, this is something that is not well accepted uh, by the patient as well as by the family members. But we should empathetically try to um, uh, bring up this topic uh, during the consultations. And these would include uh, 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 prompting the patient to uh, you know, make their last will and uh, um, sort of uh, tie up all their financial commitments and the see to their financial management. And also we should um, uh, also discuss uh, with them what their wishes are, even, even if possible, what their end of life wishes are. So uh, even though they're not used in our setup, I think it's uh, time that we uh, start practicing this uh, method. And finally, uh, we have to remember that dementia patients are at a high risk of getting lost they can hurt themselves, they can have falls. So we should uh, encourage them to have medical alert systems. Uh, our medical alert systems may not be uh, in par with uh, some of the developed countries and um, uh, uh, we do not use them and we do not understand the importance of this, but it's, it's a very important concept that uh, we should all um, uh, know. And um, uh, the, there are two problems. Even if you get the patient to use a medical alert system, the public should also be aware that if an alert is um, raised, then they should how to respond and how to uh, be aware that there is an alert. So the, the most simplest uh, medical alert system is that we could get the patient to carry a card because the common thing that's going to happen is the patient may get lost. So if someone finds him and he may not even be able to tell his name or address. So if he can carry a card or wear a, a bracelet where it gives the name of the patient and his address and contact number of one of the relatives, uh, that is one of the simplest medical alert systems that we can use. And I think it's it's uh, probably time that we, uh, we uh, get our patients uh, used to this and the relatives used to this but some of them can feel this to be uh, stigmatizing, but again, it depends on how we put it across to them. So finally, to summarize, um, I just want to uh, reinforce on the fact that uh, pharmacological management does play a role, but uh, there are much more non-pharmacological management principles that are very important in the holistic management of these patients. And also we have to fix targets on the duration of therapy, and this should be well-defined and discussed well ahead of time. And uh, it's very important to minimize the distress to the patient and also discuss on treatments at late stages of dementia and end of life issues, address communication issues and train the carer and the relatives to uh, handle the communication issues. We should, uh, be very empathetic towards the carer and see that there's no carer burnout, especially with um, uh, our, our facilities not providing any respite to the carers. Uh, we could talk about driving and also planning of life um, when the dementia is mild. And we should reinforce and get our patients to get at least a very simple medical alert in terms of just their phone numbers and names and contact address. But finally, the most important step in the management of dementia 
is keeping the patient comfortable. And this is a very, very essential step. And I think to me, I would say it is the most uh, important and the most crucial part in the management of patients with dementia. Thank you.